All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson. My name is Eddie Watson, and this is ICU Advantage, where I'm giving you the confidence to succeed in the ICU by breaking down complex critical care subjects and making them easy to understand. Now, if you'd be interested in more critical care content such as this video, then I really invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon though and select all notifications, that way you're never gonna miss out when I release a new lesson. And in today's lesson, we're going to start out with an introduction to temporary pacemakers. Now, I know this is a subject that a lot of people are just not very comfortable with unless you've had the opportunity to work with these a whole lot. And so the purpose of this series here is going to hopefully be to give you guys the information and the knowledge you need so that you'll feel comfortable in taking care of patients with these temporary pacemakers. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. All right, you guys, so what is a pacemaker? Essentially, this is an artificial device that's gonna be able to deliver timed electrical stimulus, which is gonna result in cardiac depolarization and thus contraction. Now, when the heart's unable to generate either frequent enough impulses or it's just unable to conduct those impulses to the ventricles, then we need to take over and ensure that our patients have an adequate heart rate. There's several ways in which we can do this, as well as several reasons why we would need to. And so to start this off here, I do want to do a very quick review over the conduction system of the heart. Now, I know this is going to be a review for most of you guys, so that's why I'm going to go through this pretty quick. But if you want a more in-depth discussion on this, then check out the lesson that I'm going to link to right here up above. All right, so the first thing that we have here is going to be our SA node. And this is in our right atrium, and this is going to serve as our pacemaker, and it's going to initiate depolarization of the atria. This impulse is going to travel to the left atrium, as well as through these internodal pathways in the right atrium to the AV node. And when we're looking at our EKG tracing, this is going to be our P wave. Now the AV node is going to receive this impulse and it's going to have a delay. And this delay is to allow the atria to fully contract and then this way they fully load the ventricles before passing that signal onto the bundle of Hiss. And this is going to be represented by our PR interval on that EKG tracing. Now the bundle of Hiss is a high speed pathway and it's going to branch to the left and right bundles going to each of the ventricles which eventually turns into the Purkinje fibers, which propagate the entire ventricle and organize this coordinated contraction. This is what we're going to see as our QRS complex on our tracing. And then from there, depolarization of the ventricles is going to be observed in the T wave, while the atria depolarization is actually going to be overshadowed by that QRS complex, and that's why we don't see it. So again, it's important to know this pathway so that you understand where problems come up and sort of how the whole process goes in initiating these contractions within our heart. So from here, let's actually talk about some of the indications in which we would be doing temporary pacing. There's essentially two main reasons why we would need to pace somebody. We either want to speed up their heart rate for bradycardia, and this also includes our blocks, or we're going to want to try and slow down their heart rate for tachycardia, although this one's less common. This is also something that can be referred to as overdrive pacing. And so the goal here is to actually pace at a rate that's going to be faster than the intrinsic heart rate. And then the hope is that when we stop, the SA node's going to take back over at a more normal rate. But really, regardless of which reason it is that we're pacing our patient, the main goal of using the pacemaker is going to be to maintain this adequate cardiac output and ultimately perfusion for our patients. And so fundamentally, the way that we do this is we ensure that they have a heart rate that's at an appropriate rate in order to best provide hemodynamics. Now, if you really want to understand the, the role of heart rate in our hemodynamics, I do suggest that you check out this lesson here, which I'm going to link to up above. But the down and dirty is this. If our heart rate is too fast, we're not going to have enough filling time. This is ultimately going to lead to decreasing preload and thus decreasing cardiac output. On the flip side, if our heart rate is going to be too slow, then we're really just not going to have enough contractions per minute leading to decreased cardiac output. And so the big takeaway here is that we only want to really do this for our symptomatic patients or in those patients that we really want to stave off or prevent them reaching this point. And ideally using this on those who didn't respond to medication options. 
Now, one really good example that I can think of that kind of make this point here is, as you know, atropine is one of the first medications that we think to use when we want to increase a patient's heart rate. And atropine is a great drug, and it really works by increasing the rate of the SA node as well as increasing conduction through the AV node. But if we have a conduction system issue like a third-degree heart block, atropine is going to be completely useless for us here. So again, if our patient is stable enough and we have the opportunity, we want to try to treat the underlying problem with medication. And if that's not the case, then we want to look to temporary pacing. All right, so let's move on from here. And let's actually talk about how it is that we're going to temporarily pace our patients. Now, in order to actually have this discussion, it's important to know the two basic components of a temporary pacing setup. First, we're going to have our pulse generator, and this is going to be the power source as well as the electronics that are controlling the generation of these pulses. There's going to be settings on the pulse generator that you're going to be able to control and set. And then our other component is going to be our actual pacing leads. And these are essentially insulated wires that have exposed metal ends that are used to conduct the electrical energy from the pulse generator to the heart. Now, once we have these components, there's three different ways in which we can pace our patients. We can either do transcutaneous, transvenous, which is something that's also referred to as endocardial, and then finally, epicardial pacing. Now, for the transcutaneous pacing, this is going to be where we provide electrical shocks via pads on the patient's skin to cause cardiac contraction. Now, this is a technique that we're going to use in emergent situations that require immediate pacing. Now, I'm not going to discuss much here, as I did cover this in much more detail in a previous lesson talking about the defibrillator. But here, our defibrillator is our pulse generator, and the pads are going to be the leads that deliver that electrical energy. Now, because we're delivering the electrical energy to the heart via the patient's skin, that this is actually going to require much more energy than the other methods that we're going to talk about here. And this should only be used as a short-term temporary measure. So now let's talk about our transvenous or our endocardial pacing. And so here, when I'm talking about endocardial, what I'm referring to is that innermost layer of the heart. So this is either the innermost layer of the atrium or the innermost layer of the ventricle. And in this setup, we're gonna have pacing leads that are gonna be inserted through a large vessel, usually either the internal jugular or the subclavian, and are gonna be passed through to the heart. Now the end of the catheter can either rest in the atrium or in the ventricle down in the apex. And then once we attach this catheter to an external pulse generator, electrical signals can then be passed directly to the endocardium of the heart. Now the big distinction with transvenous pacing is that it's going to be more reliable and much more comfortable for the patient when we're comparing this to the transcutaneous pacing. And the important thing here is that we only want to be using this for temporary and reversible conditions or if they're just waiting to get a permanent pacemaker. So for example, if we had to put in a transvenous pacemaker, let's say in the middle of the night, in order to get them until the next day when they can go to cath lab and get that permanent pacemaker. And so then onto the last way in which we do this, which is actually gonna be pretty similar to our transvenous pacemaking, is gonna be our epicardial pacing. Now the epicardium is the outer layer of the heart and it actually forms the visceral layer or the inner layer of the pericardium, something that we also refer to as the pericardial sac that surrounds the heart muscle. Now, as the name suggests, these leads are going to deliver their electrical energy directly to either the atrium and or the ventricle by being attached to the epicardium. Now, these type of leads are going to be placed during cardiac surgery and then pulled out through the chest wall and sutured in place. These leads are then going to be available to temporarily externally pace if we need to, and we're actually going to use the same equipment as the transvenous pacing. Now, one of the nice things with this method is if we have leads that are placed in both the atrium and the ventricle, that this can allow for more complex pacing. Now, as I said, these are going to be put in for post-cardiac surgery. And the reason for this is that we can actually have either inflammation of the pericardial sac or even the myocardium, as well as potentially pressure from a new valve, 
all of which can lead to either bradycardia and or conduction issues in which we are going to need to be able to pace our patient. So those are the different ways in which we pace our patients, some of the indications on why we do it, and just some real quick background and basic introduction information into temporary pacing. I hope that you guys enjoyed this lesson. If you did, please go down below, leave me a like and a comment, uh, share this video as well. It really helps to support this channel. If you haven't already, make sure and subscribe to the channel down below, as well as a, a big shout out to our YouTube members and Patreon members out there. A uh, big thank you to you guys. The support that you guys are willing to, to show to this channel uh, really are going to allow me to do a lot of great things in the future here. If you'd be interested in seeing how you could show additional support for this channel, uh, click either the join button down below or head on over to the Patreon page to check out some of the additional perks that you get for doing so. Make sure and stay tuned for the next lesson in this series where we're going to go more in depth into the modes and settings that we use for the temporary pacing. Otherwise, in the meantime, make sure and check out a couple really awesome videos that I'm going to link to right here. And then lastly, don't forget to check out some of the awesome shirts that I have linked to down below this video. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. You guys have a great day.